Emily Hathcote, how are you doing today? Hey, Joey, how are you? I mean, I'm doing good. Um, I want to know this before I really go into anything too worthwhile. Uh, what is the worst thing to spill? Oh, milk, by far. Really? It, yes, it drives me nuts. And obviously, I've had a lot of experience with this because it's not just a liquid, but it's full of sugar. So you have to clean it up right away and then wash where it was and then dry all of that. So it's like a multi-step cleaning process. And that's why I think it's probably the worst thing to spill. I feel like you haven't spilled enough horrific things yet because that feels like an easy answer to me. What's your worst thing to spill? I, I dropped a whole carton of eggs out of my fridge once and oh, that was yeah, pretty terrible. Problem. Yeah, uh, the, the eggs are bad too. They're all slimy and you can't really pick them yeah, up right. There's, and... there's nothing to do with that. Uh, yeah. You know, like ground coffee, a bag of like unpopped popcorn. Like these are things that are, I feel, yeah. no, doesn't, doesn't phase you. Milk is the. No, you just sweep it up. <sighs> I don't know. It's just all <laughs> over the place. You know, I never feel like it's, it's sufficiently cleaned up. Well, all right. So fine. Because there are, we'll say a lot of communication messes in the insurance industry. What do you view things as in terms of, you know, how, how, how would you view cleaning up communication across insurance? Because it is sometimes something that we struggle with versus it can have a lasting impact. It kind of sticks around. What are the things that stick out to you? Um, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, cleaning up from a communications perspective across the insurance industry. So, I mean, it, it kind of brings to mind a few things. Um, one is the uh, throw in everything, including the kitchen sink, uh, into communications, right? So how many times have you seen communications out around insurance and it's just like, and we have this and we have this and you need to know about this and you need to show about that. It was like, you could tell that the whole thing was written by committee or somebody that didn't have a clear point of view. So that I think we try to make a concerted effort uh, to not doing. And it's really hard. You know, I know that it's hard because everybody wants their product featured. I mean, for, for years. So I've been in this industry and in, in marketing uh, specifically now for 20 something years. So I've seen a whole lot. You can immediately tell when someone didn't have a clear point of view that they're trying to get across, a clear message, and then a clear call to action. And it's hard to get there. So I do think that that's something that needs to be cleaned up. And then most recently, though, I, I just want to add into that, um, that I think the image of the diversity of our industry is something that we need to clean up um, and that we uh, talk about a lot. Um, within within our organization, and, and we've talked about it a lot of times. But um, how do we project that image uh, in all of communications, including in written word from everything, right? Including like talk about accessibility, right? And that not just the imagery of the people that you're presenting, but even how you're presenting that message, what you're saying, um, I think is kind of the latest thing. It certainly is, and you know, I, I want to go back to you know, what you said around written by committee. And, and this always bothered me too, is the, the lack of insecurity might be a strong word to sort of stand on the thing that you maybe be best at or most apt to communicate to a large number of people and worry about sort of moving them onto the other things as they sort of enter, you know, through one sort of gateway. What, what do you think the challenge is? I mean, how do you, how do you get comfortable with that, right? To say, listen, like, we know what we're good at and we don't need to tell them everything. Is, is there something that you could like go through a process to like reconcile that you know, with, your, with yourself to, to sort of have that confidence? Yeah, I always kind of envied, I had a colleague who worked at a specialty carrier that sold one product line. And so he was able to tout, you know, all of these successes in leading to sales. And they had one thing to talk about. And I was always kind of envious of that because I said, well, I've got, you know, we have hundreds of coverages that we offer serving, you know, practically every industry. So, you know, I don't have that luxury. Uh, and it took a lot of maturity, I think, in me thinking about how this is going to sit with the end audience, uh, moreover than what's important to what we're trying to say, to help me get to that level of maturity in our messaging of being able to say, no, we're going to talk about this one thing, because at this point in time, this one thing is of most relevancy to our audience and it supports our business goals. I, I've said this to you in conversation, but I say it to everybody. To me, marketing strategy is business strategy. Business strategy is marketing strategy. They go hand in hand. Um, and so as marketers, 
you know, we need to align to the business strategy and what the business wants, but finding that right time for that message. You know, and you can hear it in insurance. You can hear why one of the big brands starts promoting their boat insurance over their homeowners, right? Um, and then you start to hear things. I just heard an ad on the, the radio because I do listen to real radio uh, with commercials and everything. I'm, I know, I know, I know. Um, but, <laughs> but they were talking about equipment breakdown. And I thought, well, that's so interesting. What made them want to focus that message on equipment breakdown right now? What was the reasoning behind it? Because they obviously sell a whole lot more stuff than that. How do you get to really refine to that one little point? So I think it's a level of maturity and really more thinking about what's relevant to your audience versus what the business is needing at that moment. So yes, uh, I love the marketing strategy, business strategy, right? And you know, the agent's perspective, right? They're sitting there in the agency. And I, the thing that always kind of got me was, they wanted to force one into the other, right? They wanted to force the business strategy into the marketing strategy. They wanted to force the, you know, the marketing strategy into the business strategy. And and sometimes, you know, yeah, you want to compete on auto insurance, right? But that's something that's going to be hard to do on like in the digital world, right? That's something that you're not going to get a lot of traction for. So it's like being opportunistic, I guess, with what you have available to you and, and being, I guess, comfortable saying like, well, it might not be our number one product, but we can get certainly a lot of attention through it. I guess I don't know if there's really a question there, but it's just, that's one of the things that drove me nuts in terms of like putting the two together, you know? Yeah, no, exactly. And then I think, and then that's the sales job, you know, so marketing and sales go back and forth with each other, right? Sales should feed needs to marketing, marketing feel, feeds, you know, opportunity to sales. So then it's like, well, I'm going to get them in the door for you. It's your job to walk them through that door and seal the deal. You know, my job is the door opener. And if that door opener is something that's catchy at that moment, look, I got them to you. Now you do your job because you're really good at it, right? And that's when you can talk about what are your real needs. And then you can start to match other coverages and do your cross sell and know where their gaps are and say, well, I've got this coverage, this coverage, this coverage. Now I can talk to you holistically as a client one-to-one -one relationship versus marketing's job is to get them in the door. And you know, if, if boat insurance in the summertime months gets them in, but they also need homeowners, you know, there's your your opportunity. I think it is a trade off, and and to me, the way that we've found success in in doing that is just then by sh showing success in the numbers. You know, but you have to be willing to take that risk as an agency owner or principal or the leading you know uh, directors or even any insurance firm of taking that risk of letting marketing try it and see what the results are, and then letting sales do their job as to what they're really good at. So. Uh if, Have like, I stumped you? I, I feel like I stumped you on the next question, Joey. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. So this is where I want to go. So this is where I want to go. So if if eighty percent of agencies are, are like two million and under, right, give or take, somewhere in that number tends to fluctuate, right? That generally puts them in like the twenty to thirty employee range, give or take. You know, maybe thirty, give or take, right? So of those thirty people, maybe one of them is a full time marketer. Maybe one of maybe. them is share, like okay. a half time marketer, right? So mm -hmm. I guess what is what is that conversation to the agency principal? principle of that person that needs to open the door because forever it's they're beating it on their chest they're the one that drags it in through the door right they're the one that does everything right so mm -hmm. i guess how could agencies in that sort of size range look to optimize that position or, or just take it take a chance even one on a person and or if they wanted to sort of level their skills up a little bit to even maybe be doing it themselves in a different way um, well, the world of marketing has changed dramatically, right? My uh, husband studied advertising in college, and they were, you know, still putting paper headlines over images and how is this going to look in a newspaper? And that was pretty much advertising <laughs> in the day um, when he was studying it, you know, and fast forward to where we are now, the digital technologies and tools that are available to us kind of makes everybody uh, have access to what the world-class brands have access to. You know, it might be on a smaller scale, but there's so many uh, software as a service providers that you know, their model is to have more people accessing their tools, which drives the cost down for everybody. So, so you can you can always kind of access that thing. And and I think also the education around uh, marketing how to is way more accessible than it used to be. You used to have to go to you know annual conferences to learn what's new and and what's next in in the world of marketing. Um, far be it try to find one that was focused on insurance, right? Fortunately, we do have one in our field. We have the Insurance Marketing and Communication Association completely tailored to our industry. So there's there's opportunities out there. I think, you know, when talking to agencies, because I was 
uh, very involved in the the big eye and, and really had a lot of experiences in talking to agencies about marketing. They say, oh, yeah, I've got somebody who does that part time on the side. And I said, well, how, how are they doing for you? Well, they make some flyers and they send out our client newsletter. You know, <laughs> there are, are so many more ways to go about using marketing, but it just depends on what your business goals are. If the principal is looking at their agency and saying, where are we going to find that growth this year? Is it in retention? You know, it doesn't always have to be new business. Maybe it's in retention. What are you doing for your current client communications that's helping them to, to stay loyal to you so that you're not just reaching out at the time of renewal and saying, it's time to talk about your insurance. Um, you know, what are those little touch points that you can put together throughout the year that are meaningful to them? That's also easy to, to get the data. So, you know, I love the agencies that have put together um, client communications programs strictly focused on retention. And then at the point, cross-sell, right? So the salespeople do the cross-sell. They don't have to do that in their marketing part of it. They're doing a client engagement kind of thing. And they know when um, the client's birthday is, you know, if it's a business, they know when their business opens. So, they know what their business anniversary is, and they have a touch point built in for those things. Because if you can gather that data, now there are systems where you can put that data into it, and you could literally build a self running communications program for your clients. And it takes a lot to build it. But once it's going, it takes very little to actually manage it. And instead of managing the execution, you're managing the data and you're managing the results. And then you're looking to see, did this do anything for us? But that's a free, pretty much no cost thing to do using an email system and probably your agency CRM or however you're managing your client data already. Uh, it's the same thing of like, you know, in the old days when you get a birthday card from your realtor. Um, you know, that's, and, and, and I still get one from my financial advisor, you know, and they, they, that, that stuff still works. So I, I think it's, it's a matter of, of trying to focus on on what is your end like your ultimate business goal. If it is about new business submissions then there's different tactics to use in that way too. Where are your clients? How can you reach them? What motivates them and what are you trying to do with that touch point with that motivation? I like the companies that think if they just get the birthday message within the month that you were born they feel like they're they're winning but uh, you know <laughs> hey, I guess you'll take it when you can get it. It's like, yeah, my birthday was last week, man, but hey, you're close enough. Sure. You're right. Um, yeah. What's, uh, what do you think your greatest communication skill is? Uh, listening. So I feel like that's also changed in the world of marketing too, is there was so much push out. Um, and you can see, Joey, I relate everything to marketing because that's just what I love to do. Uh, and I, you know, constantly study and evaluate it. But I, I think, um, you know, marketing used to be a very like push out the communications kind of approach. That was that was Marcom. That was marketing communications as we push out, push out. Now with all of the measurement tools and the social media that's available. So your clients are actually talking and you can find things out about them. Um, I think listening is the greatest skill professionally that I could have, but it's also probably my greatest communication skill because then that allows me to build on my second greatest communication skill, which is adapting the message to the audience. You can quickly figure out how can I talk to this person? You know, uh, you can kind of figure out what's, what's going to help me relate to them. Well, that was going to be my next question and you kind of answered it. So I'm going to go a, a version of that anyway. So once you're in that process of adapting one, what is that like? You know, what, what is that process like for you in terms of the things you think about? And two, what is your best tactical way to communicate it? Like, again, what feels like you've made the most headway in actually impacting that person with receiving that message? Marketing to me is a little bit about getting somebody to do something that you want them to do and making them think that they wanted to do it. Uh, so it's a little bit of the, um, I don't, I don't want to call it manipulation because that sounds really bad, but it, it, it is more trying to tailor based on what they have interests in. And ultimately you're trying to get them to do something that you want them to do. But isn't that kind of the case with, um, a lot of business relationships, you know, when you're, you're in, you're in a, a, a business relationship and you're talking, everybody comes in with their own goals and, and expected outcomes of that. Um, so you do need to have an outcome. So, um, you know, I don't know if I actually answered that question specifically, but 
Um, getting to know motivations, I think, is the biggest part, you know, and then the style. Tone and voice is super important. You know, um, I once had a legal partner in, in my last company who, who said, our agents are listening to the classical music station. They're not listening to, you know, the rock and roll station. And I thought, no, actually, we know our agents and they're not. You know, so I don't need to talk. I don't need my, my voice, whether that's in words or imagery, to sound that way. I need it to sound this other way. Now, if they had been in a more classical music, you know, genre or whatever, and that kind and a little bit more subdued and, you know, longer words and a quieter voice and a little bit more, you know, steady, then I would have tailored it to that way. But, but they weren't. They wanted to be talked to like professionals and like colleagues. Um, and that's a little bit different. I think that's, that's probably one of the things everybody overlooks is what's our voice, what's our voice, what's our voice? Well, what, what does the person on the other end, you know, how, how do they receive that? How do they want to be talked to and talked with? I mean, I'm sure there's been many marriages saved with the idea of just making it their idea, right? Like that's, you know, that's what, that's what marketing is, I think, right? You know, it's just it making is. you feel like it's their idea. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's a good tactic. And uh, we're all trying to do it in some, some levels. Uh, so you brought up something around the idea of awareness, right? Because sometimes you might not even be aware of how your, you know, we go back to your greatest sort of communication skill of listening. How do you sort of level set, pull out of that uh, and get sort of an awareness as to like the way you are communicating, how how off it might be with what, you know, like you said, you know, the classical versus the rock station. Is there anything you can do to sort of maybe bring in somebody to say, Hey, listen, I'm going to say this to you. And how does this react to you? you know, I mean, just, I feel like a lack of awareness in a lot of cases is, is something that, that challenges agents and just the way they communicate as well. Yeah. And you know, that interpersonal communication being, being able to form a connection with somebody look in our industry, I think the agents have the hardest job in the world. Um, you know, there's a reason why I'm not on that side, because it's a very good business. Love the entrepreneurial nature of it. You know, what you put in is what you get out of it. You know, that's great. It is so hard. The most successful people that I see are the ones that are able to realize how to form an interpersonal connection and communication and, and versus those who are not and just keep struggling. It's like, well, you're not, you're not hitting them. You're not relating to them um, in that way. So if, if we had to boil down everything to, you know, an agency principal or somebody that's looking to just level up their, you know, communication within their own client base, what's the one thing about, that stands above everything else that you would say, this is where if I had to do anything else, this is what I'm doing? Ooh, that's a good question. I, I think, you know, it kind of goes back to the example that I talked about before of setting up that constant client communication. I mean, it's a lot harder to try to find new business than it is to keep your current business, right? So if it was there's one thing, I would focus on how are we treating our current clients? Do we treat them like they are our bread and butter, like that they matter to us more than anything? Um, what does that part look like to your agency versus the new, 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 I got to get my brand out there. I got to do this. I got to do that. Uh, you know, there's so many different avenues that you can go down from a marketing perspective and, and brand awareness and brand recognition is very important. It's what creates the surround sound so that your team doesn't have to spend the first five to 10 minutes of the meeting explaining who you are, right? They already know it. There are ways that you can do it that are authentic to you, your agency's message, who, what you stand for, um, that keeps that there. But if I were to start anything, if something didn't exist around how are we treating our current clients, um, I think, uh, you know, that's the the very first place that I would probably start if, if something, if nothing existed at all. All right, Emily, I got three more questions for you. And the first one, very simply, uh, what's one thing that you hope you never forget? Oh, one thing I hope I never forget, you know, so there's a professional part of that answer. And there's a personal part of that answer. Uh, professionally, I hope I never forget that it really is all about the customer because it's very easy to forget that. You know, you spend your days in meetings, you spend your days strategizing, you spend your days executing, you know, delivering on all of these things, and you think this is the greatest thing and it's totally going to work. Just always keep in mind that, you know, I, I hope I never forget that it's really all about the customer. Um, and personally, there's some great memories of my life. I hope I never actually forget, but like kind of rules of thumb, I, I don't ever want to forget to just enjoy the little things day to day. Now, on the other side of that, what's one thing you still have yet to learn? I have a lot yet to learn. Like that's the fun part of life, right? You learn something new every day. 
uh, especially in insurance, especially in marketing, especially as a parent, especially as somebody within this world right now. But so there's, there's a lot that I have yet to learn, Joey, and I don't even know the answer because I don't know what I have yet to learn. But yeah, when I figure that out, I'll come back to you and say, here's what I <laughs> hope to learn. <laughs> All right, we'll let that one slide. Last question to Thank you, Emily. You. If I were to hand you a magic wand of sorts to basically reshape, change, speed up, alter any part of insurance kind of in yeah. any way that you see fit, what is that thing? Where is it going? And what is it doing? You know, I don't know what the thing is, but I just wish it was easier to understand. You know, I mean, essentially we're selling a contract and I have spent, and boy, agents, uh, you know, have to do this, spent hours reading through contract language and trying to make sense of it myself. You know, a general liability policy is super confusing because it's court-based language. So then you have to try to figure out, well, what is this really trying to say? So I do wish that we could make understanding insurance easier and a little bit more tangible to everybody. I think that would go a long way for our industry in attracting new talent, in not making the purchase feel so painful, um, because to me, insurance is a social good. There's a reason why we have it. I truly believe in that. You know, We help make businesses whole when something has happened. We help repair homes and families so that you know, when something happens, they don't have to move. Uh, the business doesn't have to go under. The people can still be employed. I mean, there's a huge social good to the world of insurance. And I, I think people don't realize that until they get into the industry. And even then, it takes them a few years to realize the social good that insurance brings um, to our economy and to our country, to our world. Um, and so I think part of that is just not understanding it. So if we could make it easier to understand, uh, I think that would go a long way. Emily, it's been fantastic. I'm going to leave it right there. Thanks, Joey. <laughs>